Welcome everyone to the first lecture of MCB 182, uh, which will be on generally a review on genes and genomes. So just as a reminder, uh, please do not distribute the course materials uh, online or anywhere else uh, without my permission. And so the basic learning objectives uh, for today will basically be to just kind of put everyone on the same page in terms of general background about uh, transcriptional regulation, DNA, and genomics. Uh, hopefully everything in this lecture will be a review for most of you. Uh, we still need to go through it because a number of you uh, come from kind of non-traditional uh, biology backgrounds. And so I just want to make sure we all uh, are on the same page. And so uh, the main topics that we'll be covering uh, today will basically be uh, things like why do we care about sequencing of the genome, what is the genome, um, what's the basic structure of a gene, uh, including intron exon structures and how splicing works at a pretty high level. Um, I'm going to touch on uh, basic kinds of regulatory elements like enhancers, uh, promoters, uh, repressors. Um, and talk a little bit about where they're found relative to the transcription start site, as this will become more important as we talk about applications of genome sequencing to regulatory genomics. Uh, and could you talk a little bit about uh, knowing and kind of establishing which parts of the genome are, are so-called functional. And so the term functional is a little bit overloaded and uh, somewhat controversial in the field of genomics. So I'll touch a little bit about uh, that and we'll discuss more about that later in the course and we'll talk specifically about uh, repetitive sequences and how even simple repetitive sequences can even themselves become functional so it wouldn't really make sense to teach a class on genomics without briefly defining what the genome is and so of course the genome in the context of this class is uh, an organism's basically complete set of DNA and so for humans, for example, um, generally speaking, excluding the mitochondrial genome, we have 23 pairs uh, of chromosomes and 22 of which are autosomes and one pair of which are, of course, the sex chromosomes um, for most human individuals. Um, and the human genome in general is 3 billion, approximately 3 billion nucleotides in length. Uh, and it's worth, you know, to put 3 billion in perspective, of course, um, most bacterial genomes have a you know, on the order of a few million nucleotides. Um, and, you know, viral genomes, for example, can be much smaller than that. And so it's worth pointing out that genomes can vary pretty widely across different organisms. And so, for example, if you look at like a very macroscopic level and compare eukaryotic versus prokaryotic genomes, uh, they differ pretty widely in terms of size. And so, of course, eukaryotic genomes tend to be much bigger than prokaryotic genomes. Uh, in eukaryotes, uh, a lot of the DNA is non-coding. And so, for example, in the human genome, something like 98% of the genome is, is non-coding. Um, and there tends to be uh, a lot of structures like telomeres or centromeres in them. Whereas prokaryotic genomes are pretty compact in the sense that they're pretty gene dense. Uh, there's no centromeres. Uh, they don't have, for example, uh, a lot of long range enhancers. Uh, in terms of the chromatin structure, even uh, eukaryotic genomes tend to be a little bit more complicated in the sense that uh, the genome is typically wrapped around histones and the positioning of these histones um, and their relative occupancy of different parts of the genome uh, can actually act in a regulatory fashion. And so later on in the epigenomics lecture, we'll talk about how histone modifications uh, and histone positioning can, can affect gene regulation. Whereas in prokaryotic genomes, uh, there are no histones. Um, and so, uh, again, prokaryotic genomes, more, you know, generally speaking, uh, are much more simple in terms of their organization and gene regulation. And so also, as you probably know, eukaryotic genes uh, oftentimes have introns, especially in the higher organisms like humans uh, or other mammals. Um, and uh, even in terms of the ordering of genes, uh, gene order tends to be conserved across species. Uh, and it's most importantly for this class, uh, genes are monocystronic. And so what that means is that uh, in terms of transcription, genes are typically 
transcribed individually. Uh, and that's uh, in contrast to prokary in prokaryotic genomes, where genes generally don't have any introns, and oftentimes uh, multiple consecutive genes can get transcribed together. Uh, and so in other words, genes are often organized in polycystronic uh, operons. As I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, eukaryotic genes uh, have promoters and also distal uh, long-range enhancers that can complicate gene regulation. Whereas in prokaryotic genomes, most of the gene regulation happens in the promoter region. Uh, and finally, in eukaryotic genomes, uh, generally there is quite a bit of uh, repetitive DNA sequence. And so, for example, in the human genome, uh, roughly half of the genome is thought to have some kind of repetitive uh, origin to it. Whereas in the prokaryotic genome, uh, this is generally not the case. And so, even in terms of how the cell is organized and how, uh, how and where transcription happens. Again, obviously in eukaryotes, uh, transcription happens uh, mostly within the nucleus, uh, whereas translation happens outside in the cytoplasm. And in prokaryotic uh, cells, this is, this is not the case. There's no separate uh, nuclear membrane and compartment. Something else that's pertinent to uh, this course is the fact that genomes vary pretty widely in size and content. And so obviously on one hand we have, uh, for example, like the human genome, it's roughly 3.2 gig bases long, uh, has quite a few genes, roughly depending on how you count it, 20,000 protein coding genes, for example. Whereas the yeast genome in comparison is pretty compact uh, at only 12.1 megabases. Um, but, you know, surprisingly, uh, quite a few genes nonetheless, so somewhere on the order of 6,300 dwarfs. It's also worth pointing out that genomes can vary pretty widely in their uh, nucleotide composition. And so what that means is that um, some genomes, globally speaking, have higher GC content than others. Um, and even within a given genome, like within the human genome, for example, uh, the GC content of different regions uh, of each chromosome can differ very widely. Um, and so certain regions can be, you know, fairly GC rich versus GC poor. And the reason that this is relevant is that uh, GC content can have a pretty wide of wide ranging effect on things like gene regulation. And uh, even for tasks like DNA sequencing, it turns out that the GC content of sequences can really affect um, how accurately that particular sequence can be can actually be sequenced, right? And so, really, hot sequences that are very high in GC content tend to be harder to sequence using technologies like Illumina sequencing by synthesis uh, that we'll talk about in the next lecture. And so, as I mentioned on the previous slide, GC content uh, can vary pretty widely uh, across different genomes. And so here's just a phylogenetic tree with different organisms uh, indicating what the uh, relative percent uh, GC content of different genomes are. And so the variation itself may not look that big in the sense that you can see that some uh, organisms like the shrew are at 53.4%. Uh, and that's in comparison to say like orangutans that are at uh, just a little under 46%. Uh, but you have to remember that given the size of these genomes, a difference of like 7% in GC content is, is actually pretty big. And so of course, uh, as you know, genomes can also vary in terms of their uh, ploidy. And so obviously humans are diploid, whereas some plants can have much higher ploidy numbers. And the reason this is again relevant for uh, doing genomics is that uh, obviously when uh, genomes have lower ploidy, that basically means that it's easier to call sequence variants, which we'll talk about uh, in the next lecture. And it's also easier in terms of genome assembly. And so we'll also talk about assembly in the next lecture. But basically, one of the big tasks, tasks of uh, genomics is to obviously sequence genomes. And so basically, uh, organisms with higher ploidy are more difficult to, to sequence and assemble. So in the context of this class, uh, in terms of what genomics is, 
Uh, genomics will really refer to understanding the sequence structure and function of genomes, right? And so in terms of sequence, obviously, you know, we need to be concerned about, you know, what kinds of tools and technologies are typically used uh, to determine the sequence of, uh, you know, the genome for a given organism, or at least a certain subset of cells within that organism. In terms of, uh, you know, the structure and function of, of the genome, we're um, obviously concerned about uh, you know, mapping and identifying what different parts of the genome do. And so, for example, obviously that involves uh, asking basic questions like where are all, you know, the set of all genes in the genome, um, how are they transcribed and, and so on and so on. Um, you know, we're all also concerned about, you know, what is the, what is the actual 3D configuration uh, of the genome uh, in the cell. And so in this class, we'll talk a bit about um, technologies to measure sort of structural properties of the genome. Uh, but we'll spend the large majority of the time um, asking questions related to the function of different parts of the genome. And so obviously, for example, protein coding genes, um, you know, aren't the only thing within the, within the genome of an organism. And so uh, we'll spend a lot of time talking about, um, you know, where and how do you find all of the different regulatory elements uh, in the genome, like enhancers, repressors, and things like this. I'll um, we'll also talk a little bit about um, figuring out, using you know, technologies to figure out what genes actually physically or functionally interact with other genes, um, or how do these kind of interaction networks uh, form or change across different types of cells or different conditions or with age. Um, and we'll also talk generally about, uh, you know, how the cell determines what pieces of the of the genome or DNA or turn should be turned on or off uh, in different contexts. Something we'll spend a little bit less time on, but you know, obviously is equally important is kind of the role of genomics in the medical field. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, in the human genetics section of the course uh, about how, for example, genotype generally is related to, to phenotypes at the organism level. Uh, we'll talk about how, you know, how genome sequence can change in, for example, the case of cancer or um, other kinds of diseases or with age. And we'll talk a bit about how um, genomic data, both kind of genome sequencing, genome sequence and, and functional uh, genomics data in general can help predict, you know, what drugs um, pa certain patients might respond to um, or people with a certain um, certain genetic variation uh, might be more um, might be more responsive to um, and how genomics can be used for um, you know general applications like um, identifying features or behaviors of pathogens or things like this and so the whole field of of genomics is really kind of shaped and driven in large part by technology and so um, back in the like 70s, 80s, 90s, um, Sanger DNA sequencing, which we'll talk about next lecture, um, was kind of the, um, you know, the primary workhorse of genomics, um, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and those were kind of followed by the DNA microarrays of the mid 90s, um, which many of you are probably too, too young to, to remember. Um, and those were kind of then followed by sort of next gen sequencing that started out around the 2007 period and which were kind of followed by basically third generation and onwards, um, and even single molecule DNA sequencing <coughs> that's been in development since basically around 2010 onwards. And so uh, even though these technologies differ uh, quite a bit in terms of how they work, uh, the general goal is still the same, which is that they're trying to really provide you with some kind of high resolution, relatively high quality snapshot of uh, you know, the sequence of different types of nucleic acids. And so importantly, even though these technologies technically measure, uh, technically characterize the sequence of DNA, uh, a lot of their applications center on sequencing types of, or sequences of nucleic acids other than DNA, like RNA and, and other things. <clears throat>